world is in Uganda in half an hour. First in a new series, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The world simply gets divided up into things that are beautiful and things that are not. And it's the, um, it's the, the job of a work of art to provide the world with examples of, of, a, of a kind of transcendent beauty. Um, now, those ideas were being attacked and challenged by, by conceptual art. I mean, it was, it was asking why, what, what do these things mean? What does transcendence mean? What is beauty? that creeps in with the YBA post-conceptual art is this notion that it's okay to express yourself again, but as long as you do it within the idioms of a conceptual, cool-type looking art. So when you actually start talking to some YBAs, they actually start talking about their work as though they're making expressionistic paintings, still the same kind of romantic notions about self-expression, the same kind of engagement with ideas of self-examination, which precedes any kind of political or wider cultural debate about the nature of how art works. The celebrity status has become more interesting than the work itself, so the work it becomes a kind of a trace element of the trajectory of famous people, rather than a question of thinking about you know, what the work means. Most of the interest is in the person and not the work. But I think a lot of those artists believe that's the, that's the correct way in which the work should be analysed, them first, then the work. They treat the work as though the work's a symptom of their kind of, you know, their ego. A kind of scene of some debauched, kind of frenzied, wild, fantastic uh, sex and that's why the pillow split, you know, it was so hard, the pillow just got torn in two. So people can read it different ways, I think there's different interpretations. You know, a very good question would be for someone who comes to that gallery, sees an unmade bed and says, well, I, you know, that person says, well, I get out of bed every morning and I make an unmade bed. What distinguishes that as an experience of beauty from this one in this, in this gallery? And it's because the artist has been so reified and fetishized that their work has now attained the value of a work of art beyond any kind of critical uh, self-consciousness on the part of the artist to be able to explain why that's the case. It's an amazing idea that um, so many people are concerned about the death of painting, death of figurative painting, that is interesting. There's a nice one of two dead children in hell, and hell, I said hell, no, heaven, I think, maybe. Playground in the skies. <laughs> of course. It's quite terrifying to find yourself um, swimming in the shoal of uh, Prozac-infested old ladies. There's something so saccharine about 
all of the kind of the pathos and the, the nature and the paintings of ethnic people and unemployed people and tramps and you know it's just it's quite quite miserable I think. There's a fantastic juxtaposition here between Margaret Thatcher and a kind of a rusty rustic image of industrial entropy. I think that one's Kim Howells. That's good. Kim Howells and a, and a tit. I was chairman of the panel of judges of Not the Turner Prize, um, which was uh, which is interesting. Was was really interesting. There was a lot of discussion about uh, technique. There was a lot of discussion about subject matter. But I think most important of all, it was about endeavour. I'm looking for people that generally have um, a certain level of craft. Some of the paintings, I feel that you could um, go up and touch the person um, or that they're going to walk out of the picture towards me. And one of the things that seems quite self-evident are the, the number of pictures that take photographic images as their source. I mean, unless this person here really knows Jack Nicholson, it seems quite odd that someone would want to make a painting from a photograph. The problem with art is that it seems to be reducible to eyes, to looking, which really it's not. It's nothing to do with looking, or it's a very, very small part of it. It's to do with looking. It's mostly to do with thinking, I think. It's, it's a simple criteria that if something looks like something, then it's good. If something doesn't look like something, then it's bad. I mean, once you accept the notion that technique is everything, then there's no need to really ask any other questions about the work. I think attacking the Turner Prize and replacing it with a kind of, you know, the most conservative art form possible, I don't think is a very legitimate way of, of unpicking the problems. I've seen some of the entries for the Turner Prize and I really was quite appalled. Oh, a light flashing on and off in a room. Deceased animals in particular. I think there was bits of cows or sharks floating around. An unmade bed, dangling light bulbs, photographs of fruit being speeded up, showing decay. It seems like the criterion for the Turner Prize is that one of the criteria is you mustn't be able to understand the work. That's how you become a, a nominated. Because if you understand it, oh, hang on, you, no, sorry, you're not allowed. You, you, can't, you, you can't pass this threshold. I feel as though they've set themselves as an elite. Good. It's the only good picture, isn't it? I think, essentially, this is what Prozac does to a culture. The neurosis in this work is completely hidden. They're attempting to hide it behind the surface of an incredibly beautifully detailed, you know, uh, in a molecular d domain. Whereas, um, you know, us lot, you know, we, we're the organ grinder's monkey in terms of the sort of kind of psychological demonstrations of our illness. I mean, this work is completely suppressed. But it's not to say that there aren't forms of uh, psychosis and neurosis rippling away beneath those beautiful surfaces. I mean, in a sense, the painterly twitchings are a little bit like those, those, those tigers in the zoos that rock. I mean, once you get into that kind of repetitious thing, you can lose your sickness by turning it into some kind of movement. And this kind of painting thing is exactly that. You're kind of you're painting yourself out of the sickness. The train painting is quite amazing. Um, I'm quite happy that that person is dedicating that much time to making that painting. I think otherwise they'd be chopping people up, I think kind of an absolute index of, <laughs> of a psychopath, I think. You can imagine that when those people paint those pictures, that they're painting them with some sense of revenge. You know, that there's some world that, that needs another painting of a, of a tiger. You know, it needs it. It's going to get it. You know, it's going to be the best one, best. It's going to be so real that it's going to leap out and scratch someone's eyes out. I mean, the level of competence required to view those paintings is the same level of competence required to read the Daily Mail, which is virtually nil. I mean, you can be a single-cell organism. Maybe you need to kind of group with two or three others in order to actually, you know, form an eye and then look at it, you know. I mean, I think that you can look at the work of David Faulkner and Nigel Cook because 
their attempt is to produce something which is anti-progressive. I mean, there's something kind of wrapped up in that work which is deeply conservative and reactionary, but done for incredibly um, cynical and active political reasons. The work I've been doing uses casts of dead mice, dead rats, really. It's the idea of proliferation of the vermin. You have to look at it and initially be conned into thinking that it's, that it's real. I mean, the detail is really important because it's, it kind of gives an intensity to the work. And it's kind of a curious thing that you get that when you cast something, you kind of like notice the detail more than you would in the object before. <laughs> I make, there's a vast expanse of blankness, like a wall, and then there's a ground leading up to it, which is populated with various kinds of debris. On the one hand, you're looking at a museum-scale painting, but then you're also saying that there's this level of information which you're expected to engage with the same as you would if you were looking through a medical manual. What is interesting for me is that you might mix all of those things up and have a piece of work which seems entirely familiar, but then because of the familiarities being put together, the whole thing becomes incredibly remote and alien. I mean, in a sense, what they're presenting is all of the antitheses of modernity, like kind of. Uh, Theatre, um, ridiculous detail, picked, you know, v incredibly vulgar pictorial representation, and then packing them with tactical and conceptual ideas. This art is like really excessive, determinedly excessive, and it has like um, an uncool kind of devotion to production. It's kind of an aggressive gift. In a, in a way, rather than being this kind of like um, reluctance to play the game, it's kind of like playing the game excessively, you know? The truth is that, you know, you can have as many severed heads on the floor as you want. People find the meaning in the fact that you've painted it really well or very laboriously or in a very intense way of some sort. I don't think the work is necessarily overtly interested with skill. I think it's interested in the notion of time. Um, and what's subversive about their use of time is that they are producing these works which, after all their struggles, after all their um, labor, they produce something which virtually didn't need to be made. <laughs> You can still see the aesthetic tactics operating in the work in the Saatchi Gallery, but there are things there which are trying to soften the blow for people who may be unfamiliar with the notion that a work of art shouldn't necessarily be pleasurable. So you get things like gold frames, you get things that are trying to kind of smooth the edges between the edge of the work and the walls, so that you're getting this friendly atmosphere rather than an ambivalent atmosphere. You could say, within that kind of 
slightly domesticated environment, slightly ornamental environment that the work starts to dissipate because you can't work out, you know, the difference between the edge of one painting, the edge of one sculpture and the kind of ornamentation that creeps up the wall. But in a certain sense, I mean, Saatchi is becoming slightly artistic about his hang. I mean, much of it is anecdotal which is kind of problematic. We have a line of cows with a little angel looking down. So there's a kind of mortality in the, in the immortality. You get these kind of very anecdotal metaphysical games going on in the hang. But the thing is you have to remember is that it's just simply an expression of one man's ownership. I mean, I think that the best strategy for that gallery would be to put every single piece of art that Charles Saatchi owns in, so that it is an absolute entanglement of, of different work, so you don't get this sense that you are supposed to try and see one thing separate from another. I think it should be completely, completely, you know, like a, a, a junk shop. both at the Saatchi Gallery and at Tate Modern, which are bending, swerving towards a kind of a lowest common denominator, which could have a very negative effect on the production of art itself. The County Hall Gallery and Tate Modern are symptomatic of an increased uh, sensitivity to a wider public audience. The downside with that is that it de-skills the potential of serious discursive art. The Tate Modern is a monument to absolute cultural saturation. I mean, it's brazen about parasitically adopting this old turbine factory. So even from the outside, it's demonstrating this shift from, the indu from industrialization to this kind of leisure time culture. It's brazen about that. It's kind of, you know, it doesn't mind the association. The architecture has been produced so that you get this kind of huge concussive effect as you walk down the ramp. You feel very small in face of the magnitude of this cathedral. It sends messages for miles. This is important. This is a sacred place and everything in here is sacred and things that are sacred aren't questioned and that's the problem. I think the idea of just ramming people up escalators to see art in this kind of pacified way just makes looking at art reducible to looking and not thinking. I mean, I'd rather go to Alton Towers and go on a theme park rather than go and look at some Rothko paintings. You have to kind of be able to describe why these things are interesting, not just kind of push people in front of them and say, you're entitled to it, so go look at it. That seems a really dumb thing to do. And yet what the Tate Modern does is it kind of tries to give you this idea that it's all legitimate. It's so legitimate that there are no bad questions about anything. I think maybe there are people that haven't kind of, you know, walked through the Tate and seen the Carl Andre bricks and given it a second thought. You still read it as something which can only be determined as something beautiful. Mm. Well, it's, 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 it's a given. I mean, if something's in a gallery, it is beautiful. It's, that's the overriding feature of it, is, is that, you know, Carl Andre bricks um, are essentially aesthetic. Um, and I, th I think the problem with it is it's that, you know, I don't think they are. Well, wh I mean, what, 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 is, what, you what, 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 what is, you know, what are Carl Andre's bricks attempting to do? I think, I think, in part, they're trying to de-aestheticise the um, act of looking at art. And I think what's happened is, is that bricks are now beautiful. I mean, if, if you trace back every um, YBA artist to their kind of, their granddaddy or grandmother, they're kind of, um, they're following along in the same footsteps, but, but kind of having replaced the brain with the eyes. Oh, my God.
Oh. Certain artists have attempted to jam the efficiency of the term beautiful. I mean, for instance, Paul McCarthy's Rocky video. Could you say that's a beautiful work of art? The Paul McCarthy video deals essentially with... <laughs> With, I mean, death and decrepitude and entropy, um, motorbikes going past, and, um, but predominantly it's about laughter, a very specifically kind of sadistic form of laughter. And that form of laughter is used to counteract the ability for the work just to be perceived as being some kind of beautiful work of art, isn't it? Well, it's, it's trying very, very, very hard to not fulfill any idea of a good work of art uh, on, on those terms. In the caption next to the video, it says something like, it's, it's an expression of the artist's inner turmoil, or uh, a kind of capturing violence in culture. I mean, I there's, there's an attempt to kind of, to recuperate it back to some kind of um, positive message. Well, I think that essentially that reclassification by the Academy is a very fearful one. I mean, it's, it is terrified of um, accepting that at the heart of, of, of all art is, is kind of a, a huge vacuum mm. into which, you know, a, f a few people have actually very bravely kind of thrown themselves. So the problem with the idea of beauty is that no matter how one attempts to demystify it or unpack it, it still, is re it still gets reintroduced. It's still the, the, the predominant way in which art is, is, is deciphered. Well, I, th I, th I think generally there's a, there's a kind of a feeling that art is good for you, but it's kind of being sold as something that's not only good for you, but actually very easy to swallow. Why is a work of art called a work of art? Because it's hard work. <laughs> It's just simply a series of problems offered to someone to solve. You know, what does this mean? Why is it here? Where is it going? What does it say about the world? What does it say about me? What does it say about the person who made it? I presume those are the questions you're supposed to ask. Maybe one requirement for a work of art is that it could be stimulating. It could could intensify the relationship between the viewer and the work. It'd be nice to get a bit of paint on these ones. No. Dirty soft. No one's going to drop dead from looking at art. But then at the same time, nobody's going to run around s s tearing their clothes off, thinking they've seen something that's going to change their life forever. But midway between that, it might be nice to think that you could intensify the experience. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of an interesting activity art because it kind of it operates in some kind of very weird spaces, in some very weird territories and zones between things. Look at it. Ooh. Maybe all one can say about a work of art is that it just intensifies life. Art next week when John Ronson goes mad for Randy Newman, his portrait of the singer-songwriter at 7.30. But next up tonight, Unreported World investigates the disturbing role of child soldiers in northern Uganda.